This is your ultimate stop for everything sports. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Should I say more? From the NFL, MLB, the NBA, to MMA. It's all in here. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Listen now. Thank you for listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast, where we discuss all the latest news in the world of sports. My name is Ben. And I'm Anthony. And we are here on a Friday, leading you into the weekend. Alex is out of the studio as he is on Friday, so Anthony and I will be taking care of you here at the GSMC Sports Podcast. Going to be talking a lot of NFL news, talking about the World Series. We have Game 3, Game 4, and Game 5 coming up here, and then in Wrigley Field in Chicago. And then we'll also be talking about college football. A lot of great matchups within ranked opponents this week that we will be breaking down for you later in the show. But first, we're going to talk some NFL news. We're going to review last night's game, Thursday Night Football, between the Tennessee Titans and the Jacksonville Jaguars, as well as lead you into the weekend. So really, last night, one thing was made pretty clear. The Jaguars stink. They're no good. The Jaguars get absolutely blown out 36-22. to And don't let that final score fool you because Jacksonville does score two garbage time touchdowns late in the game. So it was actually 36 to 8 at one point. Tennessee was up 27 to 0 at the half. Absolutely dominated the game. DeMarco Murray, yet again, a great performance. 123 yards rushing and one touchdown through eight games. He's already got more yards than he did all of last year as a part of the Philadelphia Eagles. Marcus Mariota throws for two scores. 270 yards, 18 of 22. Very, very efficient on the night for Tennessee. He's got multiple touchdown throws in four straight games now. Seems like he's really sort of, not necessarily developing, but progressing well. With really a lack of targets there at wide receiver, Kendall Wright led the way for Tennessee, 84 yards and a touchdown. But then no one else really on Tennessee on their offense at the wide receiver position is really elite. Kind of just makeshift what they have. Delaney Walker's a pretty good tight end. He had 75 yards on the night, but... Marcus Mariota doing a lot with what he doesn't really have in, in the passing game, but a lot of running game. Yeah, so it's one of those things with uh, DeMarco Murray. Like you said, he's equaled what he did last year. It's one of those things where he, coming into this game, the Jaguars averaged 109 yards on the ground they gave up every week, so you could see him doing something like this. The Jaguars, I mean, Blake Bortles is the king of the fantasy football garbage time. I need a couple more yards, and he's got you. Like, if you, that's, if you just looked at the game, like, if you – Saw nothing else, and after everything else, she looked over. Oh, Blake Bortles, look at that. Okay, 337 yards, three touchdowns, had a couple, you know, 22 yards rushing. It's like, oh, okay, cool. No, it, like the whole game, like they didn't even have 60 yards of total offense at halftime. So it's, or at least, yeah, not including kick rocks. Yeah, so 60 yards before halftime, like you said, they were getting shut out at halftime. It was just one of those games where, I mean, for Tennessee, congratulations. You look pretty decent as a football team. You can at least see improvement with Mariota, second year in the league. Maybe you have something in him in Tennessee. And for Jacksonville, I mean, you came into the season with hope, right? Because you had the players on defense. You had Jalen Ramsey. You had Miles Jack. You had Dante Pelly. You had all these people. It's like, oh, okay, this team might actually be good. And just – it's nothing. I and mean, even the people that were doing good last year, Allen Robinson, Hearns, and everybody else, like they're not doing the same things as they did last year. You thought maybe because Blake Bortles had done well with that, maybe they can take a step forward. The running game, I mean, TJ Yeldon was the leading running back rusher of the team because Blake Bortles had the most rushing yards as a whole. Yeldon had 20 yards in total, and he's technically your leader in rushing with 220 yards. And just, I don't know what you say about Jacksonville. I mean, the team, their head coach probably will get fired at the end of the year, if not before that. And it's just not a good sight right now for Jacksonville. So I might be pronouncing this wrong, but I think the Jacksonville Jaguars owner is Shad Khan. Yeah, Shad Khan, yeah. So he actually held a team meeting on Monday mm-hmm. to try and sort of revitalize the team, get some interest in them, sort of build up their confidence. 
And then they go out on Thursday and get absolutely blown out by a Tennessee team who now sit at 4-4, four and four, which already they have another, one more win than they had all of last year with three wins, so that's, mm-hmm. that's pretty good. But it's definitely not like they went out and played an elite team in this league. They, right. they played a, a divisional opponent, which honestly could have been a winnable game on the road. So they go out and get absolutely blown out. And as you mentioned, Gus Bradley was already on the hot seat. The owner calls a team meeting on Monday, and then you go in and put in this performance along with some of these players. Right. Like, that does not bode well for you. Jacksonville, a team that a lot of people sort of before the season believed the hype a little bit and said they could be that next team to sort of make that jump, kind of like the Raiders did last year or even mm-hmm. a little bit beyond that into the playoffs because their offense was so so good last year. Allen Robinson, 1,400 yards, 14 touchdowns. But the defense was really, really young and – maybe a year away, and we can see really even that offense has taken kind of a step back, Blake Bortles in particular. Like you mentioned, if you look at just his stat line, 337-3, and three, you'd think he had a monster game, but yeah. he really didn't. He threw 33 of 54, so he incompleted 21 passes. So his completion percentage wasn't all that great either, and they were just down from this game right from the get-go, so they had to sort of play from behind the whole time. They couldn't really get anything going. So, I mean... Jacksonville are definitely done. I think Gus Bradley definitely gets fired by at least the end of the year. So, I mean, for Tennessee now at 4-4 four and four, in a really weak division with Houston and Indianapolis, the AFC South, do you think they have any chance of staying up there? I Not really. I think, you know, at the end of it, like, this is whole division, right? The entirety of the AFC South is, tr- is trash. Like, everyone, at least when I checked back a little bit ago, they were all under as far as points allowed uh, and points scored, they, like, if I had to take a guess, I would say that Houston just stays up there because that defense is still pretty good even without J.J. Watt. Don't get me wrong, the quarterback in Houston is trash. Brock Osweiler, he had about 3.2 or 3.3 yards per pass in that Monday night football game that we all watched and loved. If I had to guess, I would say that Houston's the one that stays up there. I do like what Tennessee's doing, though. At least now you have a good running back. You know, maybe you get a wide receiver in the draft this year to kind of help Marcus Mariota out. You know, the leading runner, leading receiver is a tight end, so it's just maybe just one of those things. Of worst case there, he just checks down to the tight end. So now if you give him a deep threat, I think the Tennessee Titans, by next year, you know, assuming that Mariota takes another leave, I think they could win the division next year, though. So, Jax, I'm sorry, not Jacksonville, but Tennessee, three tough games coming up here in a row now. They will face the Chargers, the Packers, and then the Colts. And right. then they have, they have the Bears, but then they have to play the Broncos, the Chiefs still. So, definitely, I'd say at least there's three, maybe four more losses in there. So, that would put them at 8-8. Eight and eight. Right. But this AFC South is so bad. Houston sit first place right now at 4-3. and three. Yeah. So, at worst, even if Indianapolis wins this week, Tennessee is going to be – tied for second in the division at four and four and maybe even tied for first if houston do lose right so i think that technically they're still there by default but i don't really sort of give them much of a chance i still as much as bad as this sounds i still have more faith in houston right but i think i have more faith in indianapolis overall just because they have the best quarterback i was say you have faith you have faith in andrew luck yeah exactly houston has the best team but indianapolis has the best quarterback yeah and sometimes that's by what far. win you games especially in this league nowadays so I think this will have to wait and see, but definitely last night a good, good win for the Titans. So we'll now talk about the rest of the games here in week number eight of the NFL season. So there's a lot of compelling matchups in my eyes. I think the Chiefs and Colts game, we just mentioned, a big implications there for the Colts and the Chiefs, a team who are still trying to stay afloat in the AFC West, a really, really tough, tough division. So uh, another, some more good games here. Uh, is this the week the Browns finally get off the Schneid? They're facing Ryan Fitzpatrick and the Jets. Look, man, I uh, I tried to play this game last week of taking the Browns. I've I've learned my lesson. Don't do that. That's not good for you. It doesn't work out. I'm gonna say no because it's just it's the, the Jets Rams. are bad. The Jets are bad too. It's not like the Jets are a good team. They're bad too. But they have two more wins than the Browns, and the Browns are terrible, and the Browns can't get right, and the Browns don't know who's, I mean, going to be successful in one game. They don't know what's, it's just, no, no, can't, no, can't do it, no. I mean, it seems like Josh McCown might play this week. Right. Uh, obviously, you'd much rather have him in there than Kevin Hogan, a rookie out of Stanford, who yeah. I realize he ran for over 100 yards last week, but anytime your quarterback's doing that, that's probably not a good sign. Right. He also did have a couple of interceptions. He played every bit like a rookie, which was not prepared. Makes he was sense. going for an yeah. injury to Cody Kessler. So, 
If Josh McCown plays, then I maybe give the Browns a chance because the Jets are that bad, and Fitzpatrick will be under center again, and he's yeah. been capable of just turning the ball over any time he wants to. So I'll still pick the Jets, though. I mean, I did exactly what you did in week one. I picked yeah. the Browns, and it came back to haunt me, and I've actually absolutely decided I'm not going to pick them again. So mm-hmm. I'd say there's a, a couple of marquee matchups here. One, actually a really important matchup. We have a rematch of the NFC Championship game. Between the Arizona Cardinals, they're going in to Carolina to take on the Panthers. A game that really both teams need. Right. The Cardinals sit at 3-3-1 three, three and one after their, their tie last week to the Seahawks. Then the Panthers coming out of their bye, sitting at 1-5. and five. Yeah. What do we think happens in this game? Well, that's the thing because you talk about, you know, they both need it or whatever. But at the same time with the Carolina Panthers, if you're going to make the playoffs, you would assume that probably they have to go, what, 10-6 and six or so? That's probably something around what they or have. 9-6-1. and six and one. Or nine and six and one, yeah. Like they have to do something around that to win. So which means they'd have to basically win out more or less the rest of their games. And I mean, yeah, maybe you could pull what the Chiefs did last year, where they basically win like there was like last nine games or something like that. Like you know, you could play that if you want to. But at this point, it's looking like they're going to be a you know team that doesn't make the playoffs. And then you just kind of build a solid number one pick and you build through the draft. But you know the Cardinals; they're the ones that probably need this the most because now they're said they're three, three and one. They're going to be someone who is always kind of they need the win now, right? Because that tie is kind of a weird thing. You kind of basically get a half a win and a half a loss. And I mean, outside of last week's game, because last week's game, you know, that Sunday night game was just terrible. But they were looking a little bit better, right? They weren't looking like the team they did last year because they can't seemingly throw the ball the same as they did last year. They're not bombing it out to. Uh, John Brown and stuff like that, but I would still take the Cardinals in this game because for whatever reason, and I don't think it's just Josh Norman, I don't think one guy on defense basically switches everything up that much, but, you know, they've been losing, and to be fair to the Panthers, they've been losing close games. They lost by three to the Saints, three to the Buccaneers, and one to the Broncos, so at least for some of the games they've been losing close, but I got it, and the only win that they have, the one win is against the Niners, which isn't a helpful thing to have. I would go with the Cardinals and just assume at this point that the Panthers are going to go basically somewhere like 4-12. and 12. I actually like Arizona on the road in this game as well. I think if there's one benefit the Panthers have, it is that they're coming off a bye week, so they have another week to sort of rest up and get some of their players healthy. Mm-hmm. But you mentioned the, the Arizona offense, especially that passing attack, I think is going to have a huge day because the Panthers' secondary is just filled of kids. It's just... Geez, young, inexperienced players. You have Larry Fitzgerald, who's a future Hall of Famer, Michael right. Floyd, John Brown, Carson Palmer's going to sling it all over the yard. David Johnson, even last week, had a great game against Seattle, over 100 yards rushing, and then he had like 50, 60 yards receiving. So I think he'll have another huge day. And I think Arizona will just win this game because I don't have any faith in this Panthers defense, which is just crazy to think about that because the last – Maybe two, three years, their defense, especially their front seven with Luke Keekley, Thomas Davis, they've been so good. But now they just don't look, like, don't look like the same team anymore. And I can't really trust them. I realize Arizona, not so much this year as well with 3-3-1, three, three, and one, but I think I can trust them a little more than I can the Panthers right now. And I, I think that's going to be the difference in this game. Is that I think Arizona's offense right now can match up against the Panthers' defense and actually beat them. So... I'm going to take Arizona as well. So uh, probably the marquee matchup of the afternoon game is the Green Bay Packers go in to face the Atlanta Falcons in the Georgia Dome. Packers sit at 4-2. and two. Falcons at 4-3. and three. Lost a couple of games in a row now to Seattle and to San Diego. A game I thought they should have won last week against the Chargers. But mm-hmm. So now they face a tough Green Bay team. Who do you like in this game? I'm going to take the Packers because the Falcons have been a team that's been up and down this whole year. I mean, I guess you can say the same thing with the Green Bay Packers, but the Falcons' offense is tremendous, right? Julio Jones is one of those kind of just freak of nature, cheat code, you know, A.J. Green, uh, even on a good day, Odell Beckham, even Amari Cooper, but their defense is suspect at best, right? They gave up 30 to the Chargers. They gave up uh, 33 to the Panthers. They gave up 32 to the Saints. They gave up 28 to the Raiders, so they've been giving up a lot of points, right? And with Aaron Rodgers, he's you know, I don't know when it flipped with Aaron Rodgers. For the last, give it, year and a half, he hasn't looked like the same guy. I don't know if it's 
the whole Jordy Nelson thing, and now that Jordy Nelson's back, he's still not technically Jordy Nelson because it takes a while to basically get that injury right. But we've seen that when the Packers are good, when they're you know rolling and everything looks like the Packers, they're still a really good team, right? We saw it against the Bears. Now the Bears are a bad team, but the Bears also have a bad defense, which is what Atlanta has. And even though it's at Atlanta, Atlanta's never been the team that has like a great home field advantage. I mean, they're the ones that got caught a few years ago with the piping of the crowd noise. So it's not like they're, you know, something like a Seattle or Kansas City or something like that. They don't have the great home field advantage. I would go with the Packers in a close game. You see, I'm I'm definitely torn here. Obviously, I'm a Green Bay fan, so I follow their team probably sure. more than the average person might. Right. I think I think two things is going to happen in this game for sure. I think, number one, it's going to be an absolute shootout. Mm-hmm. I expect both teams to finish with around 30 points. So mm-hmm. I think it'll be a close, close game. I think both teams will probably finish with around 30 points. Right now, Julio Jones sits at 830 yards. Yeah. He needs 174,000. In this game, he honestly can do it probably in the first half. Yeah. Because the Packers are going to be without their top three cornerbacks. And you're already facing the wide receiver who has the most yards in the league and is, just like you said, a freak of nature. So the secondary is down for Green Bay already. And then you have to go in and face probably the best wide receiver right now, playing the best right now. Right. So that definitely does not bode well for Green Bay. But I think two things do go well. One, they did have kind of a week and a half to get ready for this game playing on last Thursday. So they have a little extra rest. I really do like that. I think that makes a big a big difference. Okay. And two, they have absolutely no running game right now. So Aaron Rodgers is going to throw the ball all over the yard. Mm-hmm. If he can have success like he did last week against Chicago, yeah. and the Falcons' defense is not good at all. So if he can have success like he did last week in Chicago, Chicago he should light him up, and he should go for a lot. So I think it's going to be a shootout. Oh, man. I, I I I don't know what to do here because Devontae Freeman's playing well. Tevin Coleman for Atlanta is going to be out. But the Packers' run defense has been so good. I'm going to say Green Bay probably just makes one more play right. than Atlanta and squeaks away with a victory. You know, At 4-1, and one, I really liked Atlanta. Then they probably should have really won their last couple of games. So I think they're still a good team. But I don't think Green Bay is a pushover, so I'm going to go with the Packers in a close game. But honestly, this this is probably the matchup of the week, and this game could go either way. So Do you look at Green Bay, and Green Bay is average, basically, literally average at passing yards against, right? They average 242, which is 15th in the league. Atlanta is almost dead last. They're 31st with 294, and Green Bay is number one in rush defense. Now, there's kind of a weird thing they face people like T.J. Yeldon and Frank Gore, so they haven't faced the greatest running backs. But still, as a whole, on the whole season, they only give up 71.8 yards a game on the ground. So their defense is clearly better than Atlanta. Atlanta's offense is a lot better. But if both teams are going to basically be throwing it all over the yard, I trust the team has a little bit better defense. And I think that's Green Bay. Honestly, I do. Right. right? So I think it'll be a close game. Definitely a good game. Matchup of the weekend for sure. But Sunday night matchup. It's going to be a great one as well because we have Dak Prescott versus Carson Wentz 1, a matchup I expect to see for the next 10 years, honestly. Mm-hmm. We have the Philadelphia Eagles going in to Jerry World to take on the 5-1 and one Cowboys fresh off of their bye week. My lock of the week this week is Dallas. I really think they're just going to handle Philly really, really easily. The Eagles played great last week against Minnesota because they got to Sam Bradford and got to that bad, bad offensive line for Minnesota. Mm-hmm. That's literally the exact opposite of the Cowboys. They have the right. best offensive line in the league. Ezekiel Elliott leads the NFL in rushing with just over 700 yards. I think this is a shoe-in victory for Dallas, especially after a bye week. I love the Cowboys this week. Yeah, I can't argue with you on that because the one thing with Philadelphia, the one thing you kind of knew, worst case scenario, was they were going against Sam Bradford, who they knew what he could do. They knew what he was good at. They knew what he was bad at. So worst case scenario, you could plan for that and like you said with Matt Khalil out and that offensive line just being ravaged in Minnesota if you can get to the quarterback you know it's one of those things where you could absolutely see them winning we understand how good the Dallas Cowboys offensive line is probably the best in football and Dak Prescott something someone who won interception the whole year has him turn the ball over has been doing good enough Ezekiel Elliott might be the best running back in the NFL you know outside of maybe someone like a David Johnson or something like that but it's one of those things where Congratulations to Philly. It looks like you have a starting quarterback now for a while in Carson Wentz. Because same thing, he's not basically doing anything to screw it up either as far as fumbles and interception goes. He keeps those very low. 
I think Philly will be okay. I think Philly will, you know, score about 21 points or so and it'll look nice. But I the, the Cowboys' offense is too – Ezekiel Elliott I expect to have about 100 yards and I expect, yeah, like maybe not a lock because, you know, Sunday night can be kind of a weird game sometimes. And, hey, look at that. We finally get a good primetime game. This is like the one positive in the Sioux, which it's been Thursday night, Sunday night, Monday night, and even the day after that on Monday you get Minnesota and Chicago. And if Minnesota's offensive line is still bad and they're not playing well, whew, that game's going to be bad too. But I'll go with you with uh, the Cowboys winning. Definitely a lot of still great games here on the schedule this week. New England will go on to face Buffalo, where Tom Brady is career 25-3 and three against the Bills. So uh, I'll definitely take New England in that game. They have, you know, between the th- those, those three quarterbacks, they have not thrown an interception all year long. Yeah. So between Brissett... Garoppolo and Brady now. They have not thrown interception all year long. I think I'll take New England in that game. Mm-hmm. The Lions going to face the Texans. That could be a tough matchup. Seattle and the Saints. A lot of great matchups. Raiders against the Buccaneers. Raiders looking to go 5-0 and on the road, all in Eastern time zones. That would be quite an accomplishment. So we'll have to wait and see what happens, and we will also update you on Monday, recapping the NFL Week 7. But with that, we'll take our first break. After the break, we're going to be talking about the World Series. We have Game 3 tonight from Wrigley Field between the Cubs and the Indians. The series is tied 1-1. We will preview that game as well as the others this weekend right after the break at the Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back into the Golden State Media Concept Sports Podcast. Before we jump into baseball, really quickly, of course, NBA season is now rolling on. So we had a couple of debuts last night. Dwight Howard returns back to Atlanta where he was in high school in the Atlanta area. So he returns back. The Hawks win 114-99 to over the Washington Wizards. Dwight Howard with 11 points but 19 rebounds. Yeah. Very, very impressive for Dwight. And then we have the debut of Dwayne Wade back in Chicago, his hometown, playing for the Bulls. They defeat the Boston Celtics 105-99. to Wade did not shoot well. He shot 7 of 18, but he did have 22 points for the Bulls in that victory. So definitely a good debut for both guys and both in victories. Yeah, and Dwayne Wade's doing something that he didn't really do before when he was in Miami. He's shooting three-pointers. He was four of six from three. And that was the whole knock on the team, right? It was a three-point shot from him, Rondo, and Butler. Well, if you combine all of them, they were nine of 14. So, you know, for at least one game, it's looking like that might not actually be a terrible thing, at least shooting from deep. Yeah, I don't really expect much out of the Bulls this year. I think they'll obviously be better than they were last year. Jimmy Butler's a star. I think them getting rid of uh, Derrick Rose probably the the right decision. I, on, I honestly said this like three years ago. After Rose, t- he tore his ACL and then he tore his meniscus. Right. So after that meniscus, I was like, you know what? I would honestly trade Derrick Rose. You could probably get the world for him right now, and I don't trust that he can stay healthy because he. Just, you know, I think it was all in his mind, really, because he tore the ACL and he – he honestly should, probably could have come back. He was clear, but then he was like, no, I'm going to hold out. So he already has in his mind he's afraid of injury. Then he goes and tears his meniscus and is out for the whole year. So I think really just his mindset was completely shot at that point. And I would have traded him like three years ago. You could have got a lot more than what they did. But obviously Chicago does trade him now to New York earlier in the summer. So hopefully he can stay healthy in uh, – in MSG, and we'll see what happens. But I get what you're talking about with the whole, you know, Derek Rose thing. But there was two things that was that you could point to with that. One is, I mean, he was the native son, right? He was from Chicago, so you're gonna have people yell at that. And two, talk about it being mental. Yeah, that's probably a big part of it because you also get the guy on the other end, Russell Westbrook, who's seemingly made of wires, who you know basically had some meniscus injury as well, and he came back. Didn't matter. Looked like he didn't have any surgeries whatsoever. So. 
you had those two things juxtaposed against each other. You have Russell Westbrook, who just doesn't look like he ever gets hurt. And you have the native sons. They couldn't trade him, so you kind of had to spend a good, what, two or three years kind of in limbo. And now you kind of put the reset button, bring in another hometown guy in Dwayne Wade. And this team, I could be convinced of anywhere from 35 to 50 wins. I have no idea what they're going to do. Yeah, we'll have to wait and see. And I always will update you as the season goes on here at the Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. But we'll switch gears over to baseball now. So game three tonight of the World Series, the Cleveland Indians and the Chicago Cubs from Wrigley Field. So the Indians are going to throw out Josh Tomlin, and the Cubs will throw out probably the NL Cy Young Award winner this year, Kyle Hendricks. Mm -hmm. He's been absolutely lights out all year long, especially at home. So I think it's definitely a good decision that the Cubs are throwing Hendricks in game three because they are at home now in the series for three, four, and five. The big storyline going into this this game here with the travel day yesterday was whether Kyle Schwarber, who was the DH for the Cubs in Game 1 and Game 2, right. recovering from that ACL injury. In one, Game 1 and Game 2, he went 3 for 7. He had two RBIs. The question was whether he would be healthy enough to play out in the outfield. Mm -hmm. He's still recovering. He was their everyday uh, left fielder until he got injured in the second game of the year and tore his knee up. So yeah. Theo Epstein, the general manager of the Cubs, came out and said that he is not medically cleared to play out in the outfield. You might raise the question like, well, he's healthy enough to go out and run the bases. That's, How is yeah. it any different? But it, I think it's a lot different. In the outfield, you you have like to move backwards, side to side, laterally, as opposed to just sort of going forward and rounding. You might have to make a diving catch out there, right. a sliding grab, try and rob a home run to jump and everything, which you normally wouldn't do on the base pad. So mm -hmm. I think it's a big difference. And they, w they came out and said that he's not going to be playing in the field. The only time he might see action is a, as a pinch hitter. So... Right. I think that's probably a good decision, though. It makes sense, yeah, because you talk about the same thing, difference between being an outfielder, especially, you know, running the bases and everything else like that, because, I mean, we've seen people be at, you know, Pablo Sandoval, Bartolo Colon. Like, you can run for a space. You don't even have to be fast. Like, you know, and he's kind of got that Babe Ruth kind of physique in him to where he's not exactly, you know, D. Gordon or Ricky Henderson there running really fast. He can just get to first, get to second, and then he's done to where if you're in outfield you have to like all of a sudden just like sprint really fast dive and stuff like that it could get a lot worse for you at least when you're running the bases you don't have to necessarily go all out Kyle Schwarber is only 23 years old he's one of your best young players people he's are trying not to even he's not even cleared to play by the doctor so I can right. understand if he is and you kind of made the decision to keep him out but he's not even cleared by a doctor he's literally one of the futures of your young franchise right I'm not going to go hit, go out there and put him out in left field and take a chance of him getting injured this young in his career, especially in this game. This is the World Series. Right. I realize you don't want to hold anything back. You have five months to get healthy, whatever. Yeah. But he's not clear to play. Don't risk it. A pinch hitter, great. You know what I mean? You have – if it goes back to game six or game seven, you have him as a DH, so you have his bat there. You have him as a pinch hitter, which I'm sure he's going to come up to the plate in one of these games in pressure situations. So. Yeah. You're going to be having that advantage, but don't go out there and risk him. It's not not worth it. Well, you talked about him, you know, and how good of a prospect he is. I mean, people were trying to trade for him even after he got injured because teams were like, because they think he's just as good of a prospect, just as good of a player as like someone like Chris Bryant, right? And Chris Bryant's probably the best player on the Cubs may win the National League MVP. I mean, he was drafted. Schorber was fourth overall in the 2014 baseball draft. So, I mean, he's that one of those like really high prospects that. You don't want to, like you said, let's say he goes out there and, yeah, he's not fully clear, but it's like, ah, whatever. Let's put him over and out in the outfield. And then he screws up his meniscus or he screws up his knee again. And now you got to have another however many months of this. Just let them let him do what he can. Trust the doctors if they say he can't do this. Okay, fine, but can he hit? Yeah, he can hit. Okay, cool. Let him do that. Get basically as much as you can and just, you know, try not to get something where you push him too far. Exactly, because if he's not healthy to play and you put him out there, let's let's say, for instance, it's like the seventh inning in a tie game. There's two outs, runners on second and third. A ball comes into shallow left field where an everyday outfielder who's healthy would probably make a diving catch or a sliding grab or, or be quicker off sort of his initial step, his first, his first step to get to that ball, as opposed to Schwarber who can't really slide much, can't dive for the ball, didn't really track the ball much because he hasn't played out in the field at all, and you give up two runs. So it, it's definitely a situation where you're gambling on, so I would not do it either. We mentioned game three is Tomlin versus Hendricks. Right. Game four will be Corey Kluber on short rest against John Lackey. 
And then Game 5 is going to be Trevor Bauer, who took the loss in Game 2. He'll be facing John Lester on full rest. So, coming out of this weekend, on Monday, we'll be, be seeing a World Series winner. Or will we be going back to Game 6? I think we're going back to Game 6. I don't think they'll win all three. I think they have to. Not have to. But, like, I think they should probably win two in Chicago because then at least you only have to win one game in Cleveland outside of, you know, instead of maybe have to winning both, win both games in there. And you're putting out Hendricks tonight. Hendricks might be the National League Cy Young winner. He's been really, really good all year. And if you have Lester going on full rest outside of the fact that he can't throw to first base, He's a fantastic pitcher, and he's going to be really good when he's at home. That part's going to help as well. And then if you can do that, if you can, let's say, get up 3-2 after five games, then I'm assuming, I don't haven't seen the lineup, but I'm assuming you're going to throw Arietta in game six. And we saw what he did, and, I, you know, he's on the road. We saw what he could do. I think I don't think we're done when they leave Chicago, but I do think they're up 3-2 and in a really good spot. You mentioned Lester not throwing to first base, and that is just the weirdest thing to me, especially since he's a left-hander. Right. So he's already facing first base, you know what I mean? Or, like, yeah. you know, his body structure is facing right. towards first base. I just do not understand that. Like, that is the weirdest thing to me. They had a play, and I can't remember who the guy was, who the Cleveland player was who was on first base. It did the thing where, like, he was literally halfway to second base. I think base. it was Lindor. I think been, it yeah. was Francisco Lindor. Yeah, it might Lindor. have been Lindor. And, like, you'd see Lester looking at him, and... You know, he just ended up, like, walking back. It wasn't like he, like, dove back. He just walked back. He could see Lester was just like, eh, 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 eh. no, never mind. Like, I, I just don't. It reminds me of, li and no pun intended, because it's the Indians. Right. But we have, like, Major League Two. Right. And the catcher can't throw back to the pitcher unless, unless he's, he's like, reciting the, the Playboy, like, magazine articles. Right. Like, it is just the weirdest thing to me with John Lester. I just do not understand that. Like, I, I don't know what he's, like, going through in his mind, but he literally cannot throw back to first base. That happened, like, sometimes. That's with the weird thing that happened with Chuck Knobloch. That happened with Rick Ankeel. Like, sometimes, for whatever reason, like, it's super stage fright or it's – I don't know what it is, but it's just like one of those things where, I mean, any other time, probably that's not – in a game situation, like, you can throw to a player because, obviously, Lester can throw, you know, a strike. So, it's clearly he can throw. It's not like his arm is dead. Just once he gets to first base, it's just one of those things where it's just like you get stage fright and you're just like, oh, no, oh, no, and you assume it's going to go badly because I saw him throw, like, someone, like, did a bun or something like that and he had to throw to first base and he barely got there. Like, it bounced, like, two or three times and it got there. Like, I saw sometime where – he had the ball instead of, like, doing the thing where they get they run and they kind of underhand throw it to first. He just ran to first. Like, he didn't even do, like, a throw. He just decided to run himself to first. So he's all in his head. And I don't know if Cleveland just – they don't think it's a good idea because maybe Ross is a great catcher to throw people out at second and maybe they just feel bad for Lester. Like, I don't know what it is, but, like, whew, it's bad. Yeah, that, that makes absolutely no sense at all. But but back onto the, the topic here, I think we're probably going to game six as well. I do give Hendricks the edge tonight, and then I think the real key is the game tomorrow, Saturday, game mm -hmm. four, because Corey Kluber is going on short rest for the Indians, pitched a gem in game one against John Lackey, who hasn't had a great postseason, but he's, he's a wily veteran. He's sure. got a lot of experience in the postseason and the World Series. Mm -hmm. So I think that's really the key, because I'll give the, I'll give the Cubs tonight, and you look for Sunday's matchup, Trevor Bauer against Lester, I think you've got to give Lester the edge there. So, game number four, game number four, Kluber versus Lackey is the key. I think the Indians absolutely have to win that game. I think mm -hmm. if they can have that game two two, then you have Bauer and Lester. I'll give Lester the edge, but Lester didn't pitch exceptionally well in game one, so they they've been able to hit off of him. And then worst case scenario, you're down three two, going back to your to your home ballpark, Progressive Field in Cleveland for for game six, possibly game seven. So I think game four is the real, real key one. If they go down 3-1, I think this series is over. But that's that's the one they have to win in my eyes. But I'll take the, I'll take the Cubs tonight. I think Hendricks is a is a much better matchup than Tomlin. They're at home. That ballpark tonight in Chicago, Wrigley Field, is going to be absolutely insane. So many crazy They haven't fans. had a World Series game since 1945. So literally 71 years ago. And now you have another World Series game. It's going to be insane i got to give the Cubs game three. Am I a bad person to – I think the Cubs win tonight, right? I think they win tonight. But let's make it game five. Let's say they're tied 2-2. Two, two. 
let's call it the bottom of the seventh. Let's say they're tied. You know, 3-3, bottom of the seventh. The series is tied 2-2. I want to see what happens with Cubs fans. Because you can do weird stuff in baseball where, like, you can turn the tide as emotions-wise. I mean, we saw with, like, what happened with Bartman because, you know, as bad as people want to yell at him, Alex Gonzalez the next place, the one that booted the thing at shortstop. I want to see what happens with Cubs fans because if it's close, I want to see how tight they get and how crazy they get because this team is going to be around for the next, call it five, six years, right? The team is so young, be it Schwarber, Bryant, Rizzo, whoever. And you got to assume that with Lackey in game four, right? He's not going to go five innings, right? Because the most he's done in his last three starts was five innings. He won four in both postseason games and gave up three runs. So it's going to be a bullpen game with that. So I want to see what happens if the game is kind of close and what happens with all that. But I kind of agree with you. I think the Cubs win tonight and then probably, you know, go with Cleveland just because of how good Kluber is. And then game five should be a lot of fun. Okay, so I have actually have something interesting that just popped up on my phone. Okay. Sure. We talked about how it's going to be in Chicago tonight. Yeah. Well, you can talk about how it is in Chicago right now. Mm-hmm. Because currently going on in Wrigleyville, mm-hmm. which is just the you know the area right yeah. near the ballpark, there's been fans lining up to get into bars oh, since yeah. 5 a.m. Oh, yeah. So literally right now here on the West Coast, it is 744. Chicago's two hours ahead of us. So yep. it's 945 right now. So they've been lining up for almost five hours right now. There's a bar out there in Wrigleyville, the World Class Sports Bar. They're charging $100 to even get into the door, which opens at 10 o'clock. And only 400 people are going to be let in. And there's already people lining up since 5 a.m. <laughs> they're going to do this. Just thing. think about how crazy that is. They're going to do the thing. You said they're charging $100 to get in. Just like to get a, in. Like that's, a cover charge. It's $100 that's, not cover even, charge. that's not even with like four drinks included yeah. or a, a side of wings. That's just to walk inside. That's like the people when you go to like a music show or something like that. They have like the quote unquote ponchos, which is basically just garbage bags that they sell for like $25. With a hood on them. And, right. And, and, and like open sleeves. Yeah. Yeah. They basically because they can charge whatever they want to because it's like, oh, I want to get, okay, $100. I don't want to pay that. Okay. You see the line? Someone's going to do it. So, I mean, honestly, my TV at home looks a lot better than that right now for $100. So I, I personally wouldn't be doing it, but obviously I'm not in Chicago right now. I'm not a passionate fan who hasn't seen their team get to the World Series for most people probably in their whole entire lifetime. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess everyone's a little different. It's a moment you're probably never going to ever be able to compare to. So That's I guess thing, I can yeah. understand it, but everybody's a little different. So. Who knows? But Game 3 tonight, 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 Eastern on Fox. As we said, Josh Tomlin versus Hendricks tonight. Cubs and Indians, Game 3 of the World Series. So we'll take our last break at the Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. After the break, we're going to talk about college football. we got a lot of great matchups. A big one here in the Pac-12 that's going to help decide if Washington is really legit or not. So we'll analyze that and more right after the break at the Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Check out the show that's built on the MMA. From the UFC to extreme cage fighting, they got the fights covered. Check out the GSMC MMA podcast. Get the latest news on past or upcoming fights. Join us as we talk to and about some of the biggest names in the MMA, past, present, and future. When it's the fight game, there's just one show to check out. GSMCpodcast.com backslash MMA dash podcast. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit G. GSMCpodcast.com for more info. Welcome back on into the Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. We're going to be talking college football right now. As we mentioned, the number four ranked Washington Huskies are going on the road to face number 17. Utah with their lone loss to Cal a few years, a few uh, weeks back. I'm sorry. So Washington going on the road. They are an 11 point favor on the road, which I think is a little high. But we'll see now if Washington is legit or not. I guess you can say their biggest win was against Stanford at the time, and now they are just absolutely falling apart. Stanford with three losses now, so right. not not necessarily as good as we initially thought. But Washington has been blowing everybody out. So now they ha- they face their toughest test of the season. On the road, number 17 against Utah. Yeah, so you talked about uh, Washington. They you know, came out of the gate beating teams like Rutgers, Idaho, 
stuff like that. And you thought, they, okay, they could be pretty good, but then it actually got into the conference games and they struggled against Arizona. First game, you know, an actual division games, you can see them kind of not starting as strong as you'd like, but then 44-6 to against Stanford, 70-21 to against Oregon, and 41-17 to against Oregon State. Just, I mean, Jake Browning is – not the high, like the not the leader for the Heisman Trophy because you still got Lamar Jackson in Louisville. He's probably still gonna win that, assuming that Louisville basically wins out. If they can win out, he's probably gonna be the Heisman Trophy winner because he's so dynamic in that regard. But at the same time, Brownie's taking another step, you know. To, I mean, if he can keep doing stuff like this, he's he might be the number one overall pick next year in the draft because he has to come back this year because he's only played two years. The matchup predictor over in ESPN has got them at 79.2%, which fine, whatever that means. Utah is one of those teams who you look at them, and like you said, outside of a loss to Cal, they've been really, really solid of a team, right? Obviously, UCLA, Oregon State, Arizona, they all won those games. USC, San Jose State, they've been a really good team, 17th ranked in the country. I think it's one of these things where we've seen what Arizona, uh, Washington can do when challenged, right? We've seen them against teams that we thought were good, like we thought Stanford was good, and they beat them. Utah is a little bit better of a team with that, but I would still go with Washington. Maybe not, you know, the 44-6 kind of route or whatever else like that, maybe 14, 10 points, but definitely with Washington with the win. I do think Washington will probably lose a game this year. I don't expect them to really go undefeated. Right. I think that's I think that's tough to do, especially – I think Washington's good. I'm not. I'm not going to say they're an, an elite team. Yeah. So it might be this week against Utah, but if not, I think a game against USC is going to mm-hmm. be tough. They're playing really well now at one and three. They've won. I think th- they've won now. Where is it? So now they, they're at five and three. So they've won four in a row. So right. they're playing really well. Washington State's playing really well. They're actually tied with Washington in the North for the Pac-12 at four and zero oh and five and two overall. Yeah. So they're playing really well. Have a really dynamic offense. I do think Washington probably has a loss somewhere in their schedule. Mm-hmm. This is going to be their toughest test of the season so far, and especially because it's on the road. Uh, 12-30 local start. I think this is going to be a tough game. I think Washington's a better team. Their offense is more dynamic. Browning's played great. I'll take Washington. I don't think they'll cover the spread, though. I think 11's probably a little too high. Mm-hmm. But I'll take I'll take the Cougs on the road. or I mean the Huskies. I'm sorry. I'll yeah. take them on the road. I do like Washington. I think they're a good team. They're probably the best team in the Pac-12, and uh, we'll we'll see what happens. So, a lot of great matchups as well. We're going to move over to the Big Ten now. Number seven, Nebraska goes on the road to face number eleven, Wisconsin. This is really Nebraska's first test of their season. A lot of people are comparing Nebraska to last year's Iowa, a team that kind of dodged a lot of the really good teams in the Big Ten earlier in the year and kind of won a lot of games that they that they probably should have. And stayed undefeated for so long. So now Nebraska go on to face Wisconsin, who I honestly feel bad for Wisconsin because they had to face, they had to go th- right through the tough part of their schedule, back to back to back to back, you know. But they're sitting at five and two. Their losses to Ohio State and Michigan, which are definitely two losses you can't really be upset about. Right. This is definitely two really good losses, and in close games, only by seven points each. Yeah. So I like Wisconsin this week. I don't think I don't think Nebraska's for real. I think they're probably a good team, but they're not nearly as good as Wisconsin. That defense out there in Madison is legit. Yeah. And I think that's what's going to carry them in this game. Yeah, you look at Wisconsin, you know, they faced five ranked teams this year, or at least who were ranked at the time, right? Because they faced LSU when they were ranked fifth, Michigan State when they were eighth, Michigan when they were fourth, Iowa State when they were second, and now Nebraska when they're seventh. They're in the middle of just like this ridiculous – you know, stretch. Even last week against Iowa, they Even won that week. game fourteen to nine. But right. Iowa, a team that came into the season ranked, and last year, like I said, had so much success. So tough, tough matchup. And like you said, they lost by seven to Michigan, and we've seen what Michigan didn't do offensively. They had that whole thing with Roots Chris Steakhouse, where it was basically just like whatever the margin of victory is, that's the amount of that's the percent you get off on your stake, and it ended up being like something like sixty or seventy points. So we can see what Michigan does offensively. We saw outside of last week, Ohio State could do offensively. And they held them both relatively in check considering what they've been doing. If you count everything what they've been doing as far as all the ranked teams they've been playing, they have a winning record. Or not a winning record. Uh, they have more points than points given up. Like they've been doing really good as far as that goes. It's just you have a hard time, you know, over and over and over and over and over again playing these teams. You can only get hyped so many times. I think they win this week because even though the basket's a pretty good team, I would take Wisconsin's defense. Now I think next week against Northwestern, it could be the thing where it's just like you've been going so hard over and over and over and over again. 
you have to eventually just kind of like have a letdown. Yeah, like eventually you can only get amped so many times in a row before eventually it's just like, okay, like I need to just like rest. Like I can't cram five straight days and stay up every night for these tests. Like eventually I need to sleep for like 12 hours to kind of like reboot everything. So, yeah, that, that is a possibility. You know, you see teams that are pretty good. They play this tough schedule and they have like, oh, they should absolutely pound that team. And then that's when the upsets and surprises happen. So it is possible. But one team who I think if they avoid an upset this week – is probably a lock for the college football playoff because I don't think they play another really good team, and that's Clemson. So they're number three undefeated. They're on the road to face number 12 Florida State with their 5-2 and two record. This is, as I mentioned, the, the last sort of hurdle mm-hmm. for Clemson. Obviously, they have to play some more games, but they're going to be favored in every game by yeah. a lot. This is kind of the last hurdle on their schedule against Florida State, who have kind of disappointed, but they're sort of – Playing a little better lately. You know, DeAndre Francois and Dalvin Cook there are playing a lot better lately. I think Clemson still wins this game, though. It is on the road, so that is a tough matchup playing da- out there in Florida. Mm-hmm. But I got to go with Clemson, man. Davo Sweeney, I got to go with Deshaun Watson. That That's a, just a tough pair to beat. Yeah, and you talk about, you know, if they win, they have a pretty good shot. At least to the ACC championship game, because at that point they're going to face either North Carolina or Virginia Tech, depending on how... That whole thing breaks down. They will be favored, like you said, against Syracuse, Pitt, Wake Forest, South Carolina. They're going to be favored in all of those games to win. And I'd like to see what would happen with – because we've seen what happened with uh, Deshaun Watson. He's been a little bit better throughout the year. It's one of those things where defense has figured out, oh, this is what he's good at, this is what he's bad at. And then he had to basically adjust to be like, okay, well, let's do this, kind of work around it. Because we were scared in the beginning that you know they were only winning by – Six points to Auburn. You know, they were having close games relatively with Troy, and then they only beat Georgia Tech 26-7, to so you were wondering if they were a good team. But then they beat Louisville. At that time, we thought Louisville was going to, like, run through the entire uh, conference. Didn't work out as well for them. But, yeah, this is the last stand for Clemson. I think Clemson wins, and I think if they can do this and they face North Carolina, you know, I think it'll be a really good matchup for them against North Carolina. They might actually lose that game. Because North Carolina under the radars have been a really good team. But, yeah, for this game, at least I would take Clemson. I, I like Clemson. you got to go with sort of the experience and leadership. And I think that's what's going to propel them on the road. A team that's capable of winning close games a couple weeks ago had to go to overtime to, to beat NC State. Right. So i I, I got to go with Clemson. I, I think they're just – they know how important this game is. Dabo Sweeney is one of the more underrated coaches, I feel like, mm-hmm. in college football. Since he took over for Tommy Tuberville and for Clemson, I mean, he's he's been absolutely fantastic. So I, I, I do like Devil Sweeney and Deshaun Watson. I think they're going to win this game. There's still a lot of great matchups here. You know, I think number 10, West Virginia, could be on upset alert maybe a little bit on the road against Oklahoma State, a game mm-hmm. that probably projects to be a shootout down there. So I think they could be on upset alert. Baylor has to face Texas. Right. Charlie Strong still fighting for his coaching life, so he's obviously going to be, you know, trying to do everything he can to win for the Longhorns against Baylor. So a lot of still great matchups. And, I mean, it is college football. Anything can happen. It seems like the last few weeks we've had a, a couple of big upsets every week. Yeah. Ohio State losing last week. We saw Houston lose last week as well. And then a couple weeks before that against Navy. So crazier things have happened. And there's, we're showing that every week there's at least one team that seems to sort of get surprised a little bit. Yeah. So – I mean, with that being said, we'll probably end our show here today. I feel like we did a really good show. Talked some NFL, baseball, basketball, college football, as we do on most Fridays. So uh, we hope you enjoyed this episode of the Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. My name is Ben. And I'm Anthony. And for Alex, who is not here today, we'd like to thank you for listening. And we will be back on Monday recapping a lot, a lot of things in sports and all the great storylines from this weekend right here at the Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.com. 
gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. From movies to music, from sports to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program. Thank you.